Today we will talk about soil horizons. Yeah? What are soil horizons? Soil horizons are the layers of soil. Soil horizons is the main way in which we classify and understand the properties of these soils. If we look at the soil and we see how is it layered and what is the property of each layer, now we can look back and figure out what was the formation of that soil. How old is the soil? What was the type of parent material? What type of hydrological cycle is happening on that soil? Uh, all these things we can have an understanding by looking into the horizons. Yeah? So just to uh, recap, soils are the end point of the rock cycle. The rock cycle is uh, changing between different rock types, but every time you fragment the rocks by physical weathering and you change their chemical nature by chemical weathering, you end up forming the upper layer of the Earth's crust called the soils. Yeah? The soils are this upper layer of the Earth's crust resulting from the weathering of the rocks. All right, so what are the five factors of soil formation? Seaport, yeah, it's for you to remember easily. Seaport, C stands for climate, yeah. P for parent materials. O, organisms. R, topography, relief, yeah. And T, time, okay. So the, the end result of all that, this is acting simultaneously on the soil, and the end result of all that is that you get a soil profile. You, if you dig a soil, it's a pedon, it's a profile of soil, and that profile of soil is the outcome of the history of that soil, the formation of that soil. So if you have in situ formation, you have this type of uh, situation here where you have you start with a rock, Salam. You start with the your rock, you get physical weathering, chemical weathering, and over time, this bedrock is being transformed into soil. And this fragmentation and weathering is happening over time. We also seen that normally this is not what happens. Normally, Soils are not formed in situ. Normally, the soils are formed over deposits. Yeah? Most of the soils that we have in Oman and everywhere else is formed over deposits, not in situ over the bedrock. But when you have that situation, this is the illustration that you should uh, be looking at to understand how it progresses, the soil progressing in its formation. Fragmentation of the rock, chemical weathering, transformation of minerals, and you start forming layers. Those layers tells us about what is the story behind the formation of that soil. First influence we have here is about organisms, weather, vegetation, and all that is coming on the top of the soil. Yeah? The top of the soil is the O horizon and the A horizon. That is where you get more organic matter because that's where the plants are. Microbes are more, most abundant there. So there is deposition of leaves, of roots, dead materials. There is organisms digging about there. And they're also where the water is reaching uh, first in the soil. So there is the most impact on the top layer. And therefore, the top layer will be where the soil is most fine and most weathered and most transformed. And therefore, is where the soil is most reactive and most fertile for crops. So, <clears throat> we want to understand the soil by looking into soil horizons. We want to understand the soil by looking into soil horizons. How do we do it? We dig the soil. It's very simple. Dig a trench. We call that trench a profile or a pedon. Yeah? A pedon is what we call just a unit of soil. If you look at the landscape, you have a sequence of several pedons. Now, when we dig the soil up, we start to look into these layers and try to describe what is the properties of these layers. The first thing we can do is what we can do inside, in the field. But the other things we can do in the lab by doing analysis. Yeah? 
already you've seen in the lab two things that we can do in the field. What were the last two labs that we did? Soil, soil color and soil texture by feel. Yeah? So this is the first thing somebody who wants to understand the soil will do. Color, immediately by looking here, you will see there are stratification on the soil. There are changes in color. It's darker on the surface. You have a different shades of uh, red and yellows. And there is a, a lighter layer. So you just by looking at the color immediately, you can see that there's changes in color. So you start lining up those horizons just by observation. Yeah? Then you go back by yourself, take subsamples, check about the Mansell chart, check if these colors, the subtle changes are happening also in that profile. And just by looking it down, just assume all the horizons are horizontal for a start. Maybe they are not exactly horizontal, but just assume for a start that the horizons are horizontal. And then you're going to start lining up those horizons and analyzing them. First by color, and then you're going to do texture by fill. So you're going to see if there is changes between the top layer and, on, and so on and so forth, if there's change in the texture. Is it more sandy, more clay, more silt? Was it, what is happening there? Yeah? And as you go down and down, you will see that maybe the bottom part would be more similar to the parent material or the deposited parent material that you have there. Maybe the, the parent material is a deposit, alluvial deposit, a marine deposit, and so on and so forth. Yeah? In Oman, most likely you'll see something like this most of the time. You know, some rocky fragments, irregular shapes in the soil, but also you will see uh, some uh, patterns that you can identify. This is a typical arid soil yeah? that you will, you will see. And you already see here, marked the horizons on the side. And you will see shortly what these names of these horizons, what do they mean? Yeah, this is what we want to learn today. So what is a soil horizon? Soil horizon is a layer of soil yeah, in the soil profile, lying approximately parallel to the Earth's surface and possessing relative homogeneous physical, chemical, and biological properties. If it looks about the same, you will separate that as a horizon, a layer. If it changes, it's another horizon, another layer. So let's say you have a horizon where there is presence of roots. Yeah, So you will separate that. Maybe it's the same texture, same color, but now there's less abundant presence of roots. You can name you know, a subsequent layer of that same horizon. You can fragment as many times as you want. You just need to name them, name them and describe. Maybe you see that there is a little bit of a little bit of precipitation of carbonates, and that's already a new thing. You can layer that part and, and describe it separately. So the first one on the top is the one who has most organic matter. Especially, you find all horizons in forest environments. Forest environments which there is a lot of leaves falling in the surface of the soil. So that organic layer on the top of the soil, the litter, this is what we were calling here the O horizon. O horizon, we have different, different types of O horizon. OI, meaning the one that you have the most recognizable plant material. If you see the leaves of the plants, if you see the plant material, you call it OI horizon. And the fibric material is called the plant material that you can identify. You can see what it was before. Yeah? OE, you see fragments, hard to identify, but there is still fragments, not very homogeneous. Yeah? Finally fragmented, not easy to identify what it was before, but still you see that it's, it's not so fine. It's not so fine. If it's very fine, you call it OA or sapric. Sapric horizon. It's highly decomposed, but very, very, very organic. Not a mineral layer with some organic matter. It's an organic layer with some, or, some mineral fraction. Normally, all horizons, you will describe them in forest environments. Not usually you will find them in Oman, maybe for Salala and other more humid parts of Oman, you will see these all horizons happening. 
A horizons is what you expect to find always in agricultural soils. Normally, the first layer of the soil will be, if it's a not uh, a natural vegetation, uh, most likely you will see an A horizon first, not an O horizon. Most of the time, the O horizons are missing. Only if you have like a strong vegetation, you'll find the O horizon. So the A horizon is the horizon that is more influenced by the presence of organic matter. So the top layer of the soil, which has organic matter, which is more fertile, it's the one that is, we call the A horizon. So in the color side, you expect it to be what? From the soil color lab, when you have more organic matter, darker colors, yeah? So the A horizon is like the same hues of other horizons, but it becomes darker only. The shades become darker. Um, so you expect the A horizon where the most of the nutrition of the plants are coming from because the organic matter is cycling over there and uh, therefore the nutrients are being released on the A horizon. So the organic matter reaches the, the A horizon from the O horizon. How? How do you think that there is the organic matter is reaching there? The O horizon is only organic material. Yeah? How do the organic materials move in, in, you know, condition the A horizon? Water is one of them. If they're very fine colloids, water will bring them. And then they will attach to the mineral layers on the A horizon. But there are other ways. Leaching, leaching is with water also. It's what we call the, the transport with water is the leaching, yeah? Organisms, yeah, this is very important for the A horizon. If we have something, let's just look at this picture here. In this top layer of the soil, you will have earthworms, you will have ants, you will have termites. All of that is mixing the soil. That mixing is called bioturbation. You know, the process of bioturbation leads for the A horizon becoming full of organic matter. This is the main process of formation of the A horizon, is bioturbation. Later on, if we have agriculture, ourselves, we are plowing and mixing, and that's also a, B, uh, an a horizon that contains a mixture that is caused by humans, yeah? caused by humans. But naturally, it's the organisms. And if you have more burrowing animals, if you get a thicker a horizon. If you have less, let's say it's a soil that has a lot of earthworms, you get a thicker a horizon. If there's not a lot of earthworms, maybe you have a very thin A horizon. So these organisms, they determine how mixed this A horizon will be with the organic matter that is falling on the top. Leaves are falling on the top of the soil. All the organic matter is being uh, um, dropped in the top of the soil. So the, the mineralization, the decomposition of organic matter leads to that uh, organic matter uh, formation. But it, the thickness of it is dependent on the organisms, okay? So e-horizons. E-horizons is something that you will not see very often in Oman. E-horizons looks like this, yeah? Very white color, uh, very uh, faint colors. What does it mean, the e-horizon? It means alluviation process, yeah? Alluviation means it's losing material. If you have soils that are very humid, there is a lot of rainfall every year, the water is moving through the profile, will carry some particles. The horizon that is losing the particles becomes with less color, more whitish. You know? This horizon that is losing material is the E horizon. It will become more sandy, lighter textures, in colors very uh, uh, faint colors, whitish colors, less dark. You know? They're usually coming below the A horizon. Why? This here is not showing an A horizon, but always you will have here the, the A horizon becoming dark. And that organic matter, while it decomposes, it releases organic acids, humic acids. Those humic acids dissolve the iron, dissolve the silica, and therefore that iron and silica is able to move to the soil profile. And that is the dissolution horizon where you lose the iron, the silica, the clays, there is the E horizon, okay? So it's, uh, you lose organic matter, you lose clays, you lose silica, you lose iron. In this case, you have 
differential deposition here of the organic matter and the iron oxides from this E horizon. Now, if it goes off the horizon, it needs to arrive somewhere. Yeah? Where the, it arrives, it's the B horizon. The B horizon is the horizon that you have accumulation. Yeah? The E horizon where you have losses, the, e, the B horizon is where you have accumulation. The things are moving from the A and E horizon down, and it's reaching the B horizon and staying there. So B horizon is the subsequent, uh, sometimes you don't have E horizon. Yeah? E horizon, not always you have, only in conditions where you have strong rainfalls. It's usually where you see uh, E horizons. But B horizons are common. Yeah? You can have also the, the B horizons are formed from the A horizon, not from the E horizon. If there is not strong change of texture and color, you don't name it E horizon. You just say A and B directly without saying the E horizon. If it's very bright color, then you name it an E horizon. Typical, this soil horizon is in pods of soils, which you will not see here. You will only see in temperate climates, yeah? temperate climates. So the B horizon have usually more clays, more iron oxides, but not more organic matter. Yeah? More organic matter is a characteristic from the A horizon. More clays, more iron oxides, that's where it accumulates. Sometimes carbonates also will accumulate there in the B horizon. Silica sometimes will accumulate also. So it's called the alluviation. E for alluviation, B for alluviation, meaning the B is receiving and accumulating those materials. Yeah? Now, this is up to the B horizon is, you will consider this is the soil that you're more concerned with. After that, it's the C horizon, which is similar to the parent material. It's already with some changes, some chemical weathering, some physical weathering, but it's similar to the parent material. You don't see a lot of effect of accumulation or organisms or roots or any of that. So when you reach the C horizon, for the purposes of agriculture, that's the end of it. Yeah? That's the end. Normally, you don't see it, uh, that there is any fertility, or, but you can use the C horizon as a way of seeing what was the process that led to the formation of the upper horizons. How was the soil before at the start? So if you look at the sea horizon, um, if you look at the sea horizon, it will give you hints about the history of that soil. What is the history of that soil? It started like that, and then slowly it changed, and it formed the A, the, the E, and the B horizons. In the R, is the bedrock. Yeah? If you have in situ formation, you will see the bedrock. And also, it's useful for you to understand what is the bedrock, because the type of bedrock will give you also some properties of the soil that will come above. Already, you can have some inference of the properties of the soil just by knowing the type of parent material that it was formed over. Yeah? And if you have the rock there, already it will give you that rocks usually form acid soils, which have this, this type of properties, etc., etc., etc. And that is the, all the sort of diversity of soils you can find throughout. And then you have to go and be like a detective. Yeah? This, with these tools that you have in hand, if you dig up a profile, now you will go there, separate those horizons, see the properties they have, and then there is another curse that you will see about soil classification, where you're going to see what are the types of soil that you get. There are different categories of soil. And that these types of soil come from different origins. The, the process of soil formation is different in each, each type of soil. And, but you will play the detective. And these horizons, they will be the diagnostic horizons. Diagnostic means you will see exactly what the soil is based on the property of the, those horizons. If you have a BT horizon, you get this type of soil. Yeah? If you have an E horizon, you were, you're getting that, the other one. If you have a BT followed by that other one, a BK or whatever, then it will give you hints about what is the type of the soil and how was the formation of that soil happening. Very important is, 
you don't need to have all of them. Yeah, you don't need to have all of these horizons. Sometimes because of erosion, I've seen that before. If you have a steep slope in the shoulder of a, a, a relief, the landscape, you will directly see a C horizon on the top of the soil because the A horizon, the B horizons will erode it, will take it away. So you start describing a profile, you start with a C horizon. It can happen, yeah, it can happen in some situations. So you do not need to find all of these horizons all at the same time. Yeah. How these processes, the, 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 the horizons are formed, there are four types of processes that we need to emphasize. Yeah? We have additions, where you have a, a new materials coming in, like the BT horizon that is receiving clays. You have losses, like the E horizons that are losing material. We have translocations, yeah? movement of materials uh, side by side, and transformations, which maybe there is dissolution and precipitation in a different chemical form, oxidation, reduction reactions, and uh, transformations like that. You know, association, chelation with organic materials, and so on and so forth. So these are four processes that you need to keep in mind. So here, a little bit of the description of them that I just gave to you. All right. So again, re-emphasizing, you have uh, OI, OE, OA, depending on the, the amount of how much can you identify of the organic material on that sample. The A horizon have the influence of organic matter, but it is not an organic horizon, it is a mineral horizon. The E horizon over there will be the, the alluviation horizon where some materials are lost and transported into the B horizon. Now, you can see already here that is you have transition horizons happen, yeah? EB, VE. Why we have this? Before I was only talking about E, and then you have B. Now you have combination. Yeah, so when you look at this horizon, many times it's not very clear that it's white, yeah, you re when we see the, this, this one here, let me show, very clear transition, no? You have a line here, okay, this is the change. Sometimes it's not so clear, it's a very, it's a gradient change, yeah? So when you have that gradient change, it's because this process are being uniformly happening over, you know, a distance within the soil profile. But already you can see that is the, the gradient change, you can name it with transition horizons. So you can see here, EB, it still have more properties of an E, but starting to have properties of the B. You see? BE have more properties of the B, but are still with some influence of the E. So it's a little bit similar to the E, but is more like B. And then you have the B, yeah? So you have a reference B down here, where you have more accumulation, and no faint colors, nothing like the E. And you have the E very clearly, very faint colors. And in between, you may have transition. Yeah? And the transitions, you can separate them in different layers as you want, as you see them. Not always the transition will be clear. You have A, B, and so on and so forth. Yeah? B, C, you have all those transitions. You name them as you want. Not as you want, but as you see them as you diagnose them. You will go and see the properties, and based on these measured properties, you will then say what is the reason why you name them like that. A, E, B, T, accumulation of clays, C, horizon. Okay, so we subordinate, subordinate distinctions. You have seen already that we have our horizons carrying other letters. We have a B, but we don't say only B. We say BT, yeah? So what does it mean to have that subordinate distinction? We have other characterization of these horizons. 
we can give them more properties and that will help us to place the soils in one soil class or a different soil class or identify what was the process that happened for the formation of that soil. Yeah? For example, Bt, you have clay accumulation. Bk, you have carbonate accumulation. Cm, cementation or induration. What does it mean, cementation? You form a hard layer, yeah? a hard layer which is impenetrable for water. Usually, it's like a, a, a pan horizon, a pan horizon which means that water sits there and cannot go through. How does it happen is sometimes carbonate and silica are dissolved and they move down the profile and when they re-cement, they form a layer that's almost like a rock, a new rock, but just one horizon and that is uh, when you have the CM notation, yeah, cementation or induration. So here's the list, yeah, the list of subordinate horizons uh, that you should learn and have a look at, not memorize, yeah. The previous slides had you memorize these ones and I changed, I put learn them. Because why? I don't want you to, I'm not going to ask you to say exactly the same words. But what I want is, if I put them on the exam, will you remember them? Yeah. Would you remember them? Just read them, understand what they mean, and you will be able to, when I mention them again, okay, this is not the one, this is not carbonate. Yeah. BT is not carbonate accumulation. I remember, yeah, you don't have to memorize exactly, but just by reading and understanding, when I mention them again, you will know if it's correct or not. So I'm not about pushing you too much to ex remember the exact words. But if you remember them, that is absolutely, completely false or correct. Maybe a different phrasing yeah, will, need, will ask you about the understanding. Maybe I will use different phrasing that will demand you not to memorize exactly the words, but understand what, they, what do they mean. Yeah? So these are some examples. For example, the, what we mentioned before, OI, OA, OE, they are here on the letters, what do they mean for that, yeah. Um, T for clay, N for sodium, Y for gypsum, M for cementation, G for glaying, etc. yeah. We also have some subordinate horizons we are, which are usually denoting how we use those soils, what we did to the soils, what, how do we, humans, how do we change them. So P for plowing, for example, yeah and usually applied for the A horizon. <clears throat> Plowing means a mixing, yeah? Mixing of the top layers of the soil. So if you have the A horizon is homogeneous on the first 15, 20 centimeters, then you can say it's AP horizon. Deep breath, and we, we push through it. Now we see that we have, we, ha we already talking before that there is the sub subordinate horizons, like BT, for example. But you see now that you can put a number on the front of this horizon or on the back of this horizon. You can have A1, A2, B1, B2. We see the transition horizons AB, BC, so on and so forth, but also we can put a number. If we put C1, C2, C3, C4, it means they are not B, they are not similar to B, they are not transitioning to B, but nevertheless they are different from each other. They change color, they change texture, they change the amount of rocks, the amount of carbonates, something they change, so we can number them, yeah? C1, C2, C3, so on and so forth. Now, what is the second situation where we put the number before? For example, we have yeah, 3C2, 4C3, and then you have an A here on the bottom, yeah, 5AB. What is that? What are those numbers before? What do you think they are? Any guesses? 
what will be the number after? Huh? Color? Yes. There, the, for sure there are difference. There will be different horizons. Gradient of horizons. Gradient. If there's a gradient, you can name them trans transition, like AB, BA, BC. If, yeah? Texture is different. Okay. Amount. Yeah. So solids are formed over? Parent materials. Yeah? The solids are formed over parent materials. When you have that, sometimes you have buried soils. This is the situation you see here on the right. Buried soils. When do you have buried soils? For example, in all situations where you have deposits, alluvial soils. Maybe you have alluvial deposits, you start forming a soil, you have an A horizon, a B horizon, so on and so forth. Then it comes a big flood and deposit a new layer. The A horizon is on the bottom. The old A horizon is on the bottom. The new material starts soil formation again. And then you start forming the horizons, these hundreds of years, and then a new deposit is coming on top and so on and so forth, new deposits. And then if you dig the profile, you have different parent materials deposited at different times, and the soil formation is, is stratified in different layers of buried horizons. Sometimes the events in which form the new material remove parts of the old material also, take them farther down, and then you have some erosion and things like that. Uh, other situations that you have like this is very common when you have volcanic soils. Volcanic soils, sometimes the volcanoes take a thousand years to make a new explosion. And during that thousand years, you have a formation of soil over the volcanic ash. And then you have a new eruption and new material is deposited. And then you have a new soil formation and then so on and so forth. Every time you have that the soils are buried and uh, new parent material deposits are coming on top of it, and new soil formation processes are happening, then you have this numbering where you have the number here before the letter. Yeah? The number before the letter means different parent material, different strata of soil formation. You have one process here, and then it repeats. Another one here, it repeats. Another one there, and you can have as many as you see them. So all this stratification, you need to be like a detective. Yeah? If you look back there, and if you're looking at the horizons, you say, wait, but this looks like an A horizon. Why is the A horizon below the C? It should not be an A horizon below the C. This order has a logic for them. And yeah? the processes happen from top to bottom. And you never find an A horizon below a C unless you put new material on top. When you put new material on top, then you can get all the processes happening again, and then that will be a buried horizon. You can have an A horizon, and that will be like that for a long time, okay? Those buried horizons, they're very, very, very interesting for understanding, for example, uh, processes that are happening in depth or what happened in the past. Maybe it will have indications that how the climate was a thousand years ago, how the climate was 10,000 years ago, because the processes are conserved below ground. So they are, there's less transformation happening. There's less microbial activity. There are no plant roots there. So that buried horizon will conserve somewhat the history of that place. Clear this one? So the number if comes before or after denotes if you have different uh, properties of the same horizon from the same parent material, or if you have forming from different parent materials altogether. All right, so this is what I was showing before. You can have B1, B2, C1, C2, C3. It's the same parent material, the same formation, now what is happening is it's just that they have different colors, different textures, different amount of uh, uh, rock fragments, different amount of carbonates, and then you can classify them different, just put different numbers on them. They're not transition, 
if the number is coming b1 it's not that they have properties of e if it, they had properties of e will be be or eb yeah it's a b entirely a b it has properties of a b horizon accumulation of clays or accumulation of iron oxides or whatever but they are not the same. You can see there are differences. If there are differences, then you can say B1, B2, B3. But if you say now it's 2B, it means it comes from a different material it, altogether, different uh, parent material. Yeah. So here another example. Yeah. BT1, BT2, BT3, BT4, BT5. It means it's accumulation of clays, but maybe the amount of clays that are accumulated were different in different parts. So you name them in different layers. So this, count, this is A and B, but the B is not the same all across. Yeah? So you can change the numbering. Yeah? Now you have the, the new situation where A, C1, C2, yeah, why C2 now? It's, it's a different uh, layer of the same material. But if, it, if it's 2C2, it's coming from a different deposit. Yeah, it's coming from a diff different deposit. So if it was maybe here, it's an alluvial soil. It, let's see if it says here, but probably this one is an alluvial soil. And this was one flood brought one type of material and this one was another flood that brought a different type of material. Probably the flood that brought the material on the top also removed some layer before, yeah? And by doing that, removing the top layer, you get two sea horizons which are not coming from the same parent material, not coming from the same parent material. And therefore, you differentiate it like this. Transition horizons is that when you have A, B, for example, or E, B horizons, yeah? When you have properties of both horizons, again, this is showing again the transition horizons, yeah? You have the A, you have the B, and in between the transition is not a clear line, but there is a gradient change. And if you have a gradient change, that part where you have the gradient, you separate it and you say this is an A, B. It's a, uh, a transition horizon. And here you have the same example, but coming from E to a BT. Yeah. So transition between master horizon, horizons uh, have properties of both, but <coughs> cannot be classified directly or one or another, or maybe they have uh, um, they have more characteristics of one or the other one, then you use the letter before for the one that is predominant, yeah? for the one that's predominant. Now, one of the things that is the, the uh, uh, good information that you get from looking at the horizons is, if you have that your soil is coming from the same parent material, the more the stratification you see on the soil, it denotes that you have more maturity on that soil. Maturity means, what does it mean? When you say a person is mature, what do you mean? He's? This goes up or more. Oh. Yeah, maybe you're elderly, they will be very mature and wise and, yeah. Mature for soils, as for anything, it means the time, the more time, more experience, yeah. But this kind of, if you say a soil is very mature, it means the soil was subjected to longer times of the processes of soil formation. Yeah? And the more time you subject those soils, the more you will see stratification. Yeah? You see there are more layers happening on that soil because there's more time for the separation of those layers. If it's very young, like a fresh deposit from a flood, you only see sea horizon. If there is a fresh deposit from a volcanic eruption, it's only a sea, a sea horizon, nothing more. But if you give it time, you start looking the appearance of an A horizon. And if it's A and then moves directly to a C, no B horizon, no E horizon, then you say, okay, it's a young soil. Yeah, it's a young soil. Now, there is an appearance of a B horizon, 
Now you call it a mature soil. And if there is all this, the older on the right, youngest on the left. This is step by step. Supposing you have a fresh deposit of alluvial deposit. Yeah? This is a fresh deposit. You only have a sea at the beginning. Give it, give it enough time, plants will grow, will deposit organic matter, will influence and you form first the A horizon. Then, with time, there's transport of material within the soil profile, maybe 500 years, 1,000 years, and then you get formation of the B horizon. Yeah? And then, with more time, you can see an E horizon. Yeah? The main factor that is influencing how this progresses is the hydrological cycle. If you have constant watering of that soil by rainfall or any other means, then you have acceleration of these formation processes. More water means more life, more plants, more organisms, more chemical weathering, more alluviation, alluviation processes, formation and separation of this horizon. The more the hydrological cycle is active, the more, the speedier it will be the formation of this. But in any situation, this can be more uh, like in a thousand years or it can be in 10,000 years, depending on the, the, the hydrological cycle. But how you see it is, it's a young soil, if you only have an A and C, and if you have a high differentiation of horizons, then you say that is a mature soil, a very mature soil. The level of maturity, it's about time, but also about the intensity in which the soil forming factors acted upon the parent material. You start with only parent material, and then over time, it's being formed all these horizons. So the layering of the soils is a good indication for you about how old the soil is also. Okay? But old in the sense of maturity, yeah? If there is a lot of uh, intensity of the formation of uh, the, the, the factors that form that soil. Mineral status, you tend to see more primary minerals in the soil if the soil is young. So if you send your soils for analysis, you will see feldspars, for example, in a young soil. So that's why you expect to see in Oman, for example, young soils most of the time, and you can see those primary minerals. Yeah? Quartz here also you can see, because quartz is very resistant, you can see in mature soils also. You can keep seeing quartz all across. But you know, the secondary minerals, the transformation of aluminum silicates over time, you expect to see them when you have more maturity of soil. So by having different types of minerals, you can see also the maturity. Sometimes that maturity of the minerals is not related to the in situ formation, but the transported material already came with those minerals. So you need to do a little bit of detective work and analyze not only what is the composition of that soil, but how is the, the sea horizon. If the sea horizon is similar, so there is no intense transformation. If the sea horizon uh, is the, uh, different, it means you have intense transformation of those minerals. So, uh, fertility, you have less fertility, the lower it, uh, you have the maturity. The more mature the soil, you have more fertile soils. They have more structure, you have more intensity of the accumulation and transformation of those uh, organic horizons on top. The A horizon is more developed. The more time you give, you get more development of the A horizon. Clays, low, high, because clays, most of the time, they are secondary minerals, and they need that time for the transformation and, uh, from the primary minerals. Yeah, so there are some factors that prevent the soil from developing quick. Yeah. One of them is low rainfall, like in Oman. Cold temperatures, not the case of Oman, can prevent the development from, from soils high water table, anoxic conditions, most of the reaction, chemical reactions that are very uh, quick are in biological processes also, they happen in aerobic conditions. So those transformations need oxygen. If you have that the, the soils are saturated, that prevents 
also the quick development of that uh, soils and horizons. Plant materials that are hard to decompose, that co are composed mostly of quartz also, uh, then you have uh, a slow development of that soil. High clay content, it's related to the hydrological cycle. There's low infiltration, low oxygenation, so that, that therefore you have slow formation of the soil. If you have some material that is very toxic to plants, if you're coming from a volcanic eruption and then you have uh, excess of arsenic or whatever it is that you have on that material, and then it's preventing the plant growth, then you have that the soil will be slow developing also because there, the organisms are not uh, colonizing quick enough to promote that uh, weathering. Remember the chemical weathering, most of the time, it's also biological weathering. Those chemical reactions, they are intensified and catalyzed by uh, organisms, microbes and plants. Steep slopes prevent soil horizon formation because you start forming the horizon and you have erosion. The water takes it away. So you always keep it underdeveloped because every time you start the development process, you lose it. So you always giving fresh sea horizon on the surface due to erosion processes. And also, sometimes, constant disturbance like fire can uh, prevent the formation of soils also. So, when we study uh, in soil science to isolate those soil formation factors, we try to find the conditions in which they are kept mostly the same. There is very few situations in which you can keep everything the same because all the soil fa forming factors, they're acting together. So the first uh, uh, situation is a catena. Yeah, catena is what we name when you have the same parent material, same type of vegetation, but you have a different unrelief. Now, when you have a different unrelief, most of the time, you have change in climate also. It becomes hotter, colder, more humid. The vegetation usually changes, the type of microbes change. So rarely we see a catena that is only a function of topography. Normally it will also carry changes in parent material. Some of them will be colluvial, uh, some of them will be alluvial, different types of deposits. Rarely is only relief. Usually it's associated with other things, but when you find a situation that mostly is the same, not all, all the same, but mostly the same, and the relief is the only factor, then it's, you call it a catena. Yeah? It's a sequence of soils. Let's say I try to do one study like that, and uh, we sampled soils from Barca up to Nachl, up to the hill. So we went up to the hill, and we were seeing how I was looking in soil phosphorus, and how is it changing in the carbonate concentration, how is it changing in the soils if you move near the coast up to the mountains. But of course, the type of parent material will be changing there. Nevertheless, we call it a catena because it, there's a change in altitude. It's a straight line, different soil samples in a straight line, and it's going up the hills, and the, uh, there's a gradient of relief. It's increasing altitude, and the relief is changing, okay? Uh, so this is when we study soils, catena is one of the main ways and we, we try to see those changes in the soil. Hard to separate catena, uh, hard to separate catena only for topography and not being influenced by any other factor. Yeah? But chrono sequence, we normally have very good examples of chrono sequences. Had I told you about before about chrono sequences in the other lecture, maybe? Chrono sequences, there are some situations where you do have good chrono sequences example. Chrono sequences mean there is all the, the other factors are kept similar except for time. Yeah? One of the examples of chrono sequences is when you have glacier retreat. The climate is warming, the glacier is maybe 10 kilometers down the mountain, and now every year is becoming smaller. The glacier pushes in the winter, retreats, yeah? And then let's say now it started like a thousand years ago, maybe the glacier was 10 kilometers down, 
now it's only two kilometers down. So you have all that area that was slowly being uncovered over time. The, th the part that is covered by the ice is protected from the soil formation, the other soil formation factors. Now it's been, as the glacier retreats, you have plants coming in, you have rainfall, you have all the other factors of formation. So if you go there and study that line of soils, that is a chrono sequence. Yeah, chrono sequence means same parent material, same type of organisms, all, all the same, except for time. Yeah, except for time. This is one situation where you have good examples of chrono sequences. The other situation is uh, there are some uh, dunes that are formed after earthquake for, uh, earthquakes in Australia. So there are the, the canyon valleys from rivers. Those rivers are bringing sediment to the sea. Every time you have an earthquake, there is collapse on the mountains. And those collapses are brought by the river into the sea and they form a new dune on the coast. So over time you have, every time you have a new dune on the coast, it's a new event of an earthquake. Yeah? So those dunes that are more, that are more inland, they are older. And the ones that are closer to the sea, they are younger. So you can see the same situation of same type of parent material, organisms, climate, but the, the, the age of the material is different. So you can see how those transformations go. So the, the, these chrono sequences, usually they're not so old as we wanted, but still there are some good examples of chrono sequences that for soil science to study. Lito sequences, normally there's not a smooth transition. Sometimes you have a good examples of lito sequence that you have in situ formation and you have one parent material in a clear division for another parent material. And in Panama, for example, there's some very good studies on, from the Smithsonian Research Institute uh, where they, they see that some parent materials, for example, have high phosphorus. And the other parent material has completely different phosphorus content. And what you see immediately from the, the drone footage is that the vegetation is completely different. There's different nutrient concentration coming from the parent material and then you have different growth patterns from the vegetation. All the soils are formed differently because of that different parent material. But of course, it's hard to dissociate this little sequence from the bio sequence because the, the type of trees will be different, even though you have the same climate. If one rock contains high nutrient and the other doesn't, then you know, the vegetation will change. The organism will be different and therefore there's also an influence of organisms. Yeah? Climate sequence, normally it's usually a catena, but sometimes it's just becoming more inland and the precipitation is happening close to the sea and far from the sea there's less precipitation and then you may have these changes in climate sequence over the same parent materials. In bio sequence, also very hard to find without climate or without change in parent materials or something like that. But this is the way we try to study uh, uh, this, isolate the soil formation factors by finding situations where mostly the other factors are kept constant and only one factor is changing. And therefore we can see how those soil formations are being affected differentially by this, uh, uh, this one factor. Usually chrono sequence is the best example we can find from this. Uh, and all the others, they, they tend to vary together. Yeah, it's very hard to separate them. All right, this was all for today. Um, questions?